Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So good to have you with us. This message is for January 8th, 2023. But you can listen to it any time that you want. We're looking at James and chapter 1. And uh, we have come to this statement in James 1 and verse 20. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So there's this path of, of anger and improper action, and it's not going to get you where you want to go. <clears throat> um, it says here in verse 21, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, and all that remains of wickedness and humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Well, my friends, uh, Cain was one of these men who had anger issues. Uh, I like, I first thing I read when I read that passage, first thing I thought of was Cain, and he had an anger issue. Um, so much so, that uh, his way of life became known as the way of Cain. Jude says this himself, the way of Cain. Well, let's look a little bit at this way of Cain that's found in Genesis uh, chapter 4, and uh, that it is the wrong way to go. This anger and wrath and revenge and Wicked ways doesn't take you in the right direction. And uh, it says here in verse 4 of chapter 4 of Genesis, Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. See, there's two things. There's the offering and then regard for Abel. Uh, but for Cain... And for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then he got direct revelation from God. God talked to him himself. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? You do the right things, you'll feel a lot better about everything. Why don't you do what's expected of you and the right way of going about things, and you'll be blessed because of it. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, personifies sin as if it's uh, like a, a lion about to pounce upon you. But you must master it. Well, how did that go? Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Well, now, Cain had this mark put upon him. He couldn't make a living off of the land. It wasn't going to yield anything for him. And uh, so he, he goes and wonders. And uh, he has children. And you see that his line just becomes worse. They're all following in their father's footsteps. And uh, here you have a man named Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, the other was Zillah. And then he has a song of Lamech. He says, listen to me, my, my wives. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice. You wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, just like daddy and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Then if you reel forward, this race continues. 
And then in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 6 and starting with verse 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They were going in the wrong direction. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Thank God. And verse 9, these are the records of the generations of Noah and tells it. And verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. So the way of Cain was not going the way that would accomplish the righteousness of God. So there's a concrete example for you of a, a person who has anger and wrath and fil filthiness and violence, and it just does not uh, succeed in accomplishing the righteousness of God. As a matter of fact, God judged that and flooded them out and started over with Noah. So, truth be told, man doesn't have time to do every path, possible path, of how you want to live your life. So you have to make value judgments. And these value judgments then guide a person's life. Following the line of Cain, men just waxed worse and worse. So men need to look down the path they contemplate and observe how men choose the path, that path that men choose and how they end up. So that's what God is having you do. You're looking at the path, the way of Cain, as it was stated by Jude, the brother of James. And how did that turn out? Well, not so good. You look down that path and say, that's not the way you want to go. And so you might look at a path and you say, well, there's, there's drugs and alcohol and gambling and womanizing. I'm telling you, your life becomes a mess. It's not a, a good way. It becomes hopeless. But uh, faith, <clears throat> family, steadiness is the path to take. And you have a blessed family. <coughs> and you have joy and love in your home. Now, this same idea of following the right path was presented by a man named David. And we have a couple things we'll say about him as well. In Psalm chapter 1, he says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't listen to that advice. Not going to take him in the right position. He's blessed if he doesn't. Nor stand in the path of sinners. You know, there you walked in the council. Now you're standing in the path of the sinners. Now, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers. So if a person listens to ungodly counsel, stands in the path of sinners, and then eventually takes his seat with the scoffers, He's headed down the wrong path. But the righteous man does not take that path. His is a delight in the law of the Lord. He's going to listen to the Lord. Cain didn't want to listen to the Lord. The Lord gave him good advice, the best advice he possibly could have had. But he didn't want to listen to it. Uh, but the righteous man's delight is in the law of the Lord and in his wisdom. And in his law, he meditates day and night. That's not just a cursory reading of it, but he thinks on it. He contemplates how this will work. And the end result is he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. So there's path number one. You look down that path, and it's going to be a good ending. But path number two 
is stated in verse 4, the wicked are not so. But they are like chaff which the wind drives away. You know, and they just uh, end up as nothing. There's no, not, not even any visible presence of them. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So you contemplate, if I take this path, and I look down that way far enough and see others who have taken it, what's their life like? And if it looks like it stinks, don't go down that road. All the heartache that goes along with that. Instead, you take the path of godliness, listening to the word, following the advice of God, having a teachable spirit. And it's going to end up for you a lot better. So the wise man receives the wisdom of God's words. I'm back here in James, and I'm looking at verse 21, second part, first part once again, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all the remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So my friends, uh, you need to, in humility, a humble spirit receive the instruction of the Word of God. You know, people who think they know everything, they don't make room for any instruction. I'm not listening to that. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not listening to that. I'm going to do what I want. And so if you have a person like that, they're not teachable, they're not correctable, uh, they think they know everything, and uh, it is really a kind of insanity. So a person who is going to take the path of the word needs to receive it with humility of spirit. You know, you see people riding these horses, and they're big horses. These horses can weigh 2,000 pounds. I mean, even the racehorse is like 1,300 pounds or so. And uh, they're sleek and they're powerful animals. And uh, they put up a 100-pound man up on that animal. And he rides his little saddle. He, he just basically stands on top of that horse. And, and that man is insignificant to the horse's strength, except that the horse is willing to be guided and spurred on and uh, uh, steered. And so uh, a horse and all its strength is useless unless he's willing to take the bit in the mouth and to be guided and steered. That's what makes him useful. And so, my friends, uh, for a horse to be uh, useful to his master, he has to have a tame submissive spirit. It doesn't mean he's weak. It just means that he's you can work with him. And for a the master, the Lord, God, to use a man, he must have a teachable spirit, a humble spirit. You know, Moses, he thought, I am uh, I am the prince's son, you know, Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, I'm in line to become Pharaoh, and I can do something for the Israelites. I'm just going to kill this man and uh, I help him out. And uh, so he was impetuous. He wasn't tamed. He thought he knew what should be done. And lo and behold, he got chased out into the wilderness, and he was on the backside of the desert for 40 years tending sheep. And after 40 years, that man had transformed in his life. He had seen the power of God in the burning bush, and he was a different man. And he was, says, the humblest man or meekest man on the earth. Doesn't mean he was a coward. It just meant that he was steerable 
when it came to God's word and what God wanted him to do. And so, my friends, we have to have that humility of spirit uh, to be able to have that teachable spirit. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, uh, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So if a man is willing to listen to the word of God and he is allowing it to steer him, he will be guided in the proper paths and do God's will and uh, will be adequate and equipped for every good work. So the man who listens to God's word is persuadable and it saves his soul. It says here in James, in humility receive the word implanted, <clears throat> which is able to save your souls. Well, my friends, uh, it will save your soul from the standpoint that you're not going to get into trouble. You're going to stay away from the things that cause all kinds of heartache. But there's another saving of the soul, and that is that part of the word of God is to point you to the fact that you need a Savior, and Jesus Christ is him. And we need to receive him as our Lord and Savior. And, and so I remember as a young man at Ohio State University, and I decided to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. And I became persuadable, and I took on a humility of spirit before the Word of God. And so that's what we all need to do, man or woman, boy or girl, so that we can be properly guided by the Spirit. And it can save our soul. But still, even well-meaning men fall into traps of delusion and need a methodology to see themselves for what they are. <clears throat> and uh, so what would properly reflect to us if we looked at it, what we look like, are we in proper arrangement? Well, that would be a mirror. Now, back then, when the scriptures were written, they weren't uh, totally devoid of understanding of mirrors, but they weren't like the mirrors we have today. It may be a brass uh, looking glass, brass piece of metal, and you look at, uh, sometimes you've seen your reflection in like the black, black side of a shiny car. Uh, you might see the reflection of yourself in uh, water, um, but they didn't have the mirrors so much that we have all over the place here. Uh, so men would only get a glimpse now and then of themselves, whether they're looking into water or perhaps they were looking into a looking glass. And the ladies back at that time, in the, te in the time of the temple, they had uh, brass that they would look into, uh, kind of like mirrors to see if everything was in arrangement. And uh, it talks about the mirror as being the word of God. Let's go on to verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Well, how do you keep from being deluded? For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful here, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Well, my friends, uh, the analogy of the mirror 
is the Word of God. And you look intently into that and you study uh, what's going on. Not just a glimpse, but intently looking into it. And you will notice more about how you were arranged. Uh, sometimes as I'm in the morning hurrying to get ready to come to the service and stuff like this, I'll look and Oh, just a quick look in the mirror and everything looks fine. But then as I go past the mirror called my wife, she said, wait a minute. And she'll come and then she'll adjust something I didn't see. And, uh, you know, that really doesn't go together too well, that tie with that shirt or, um, you know, you got checks and stripes and, you know, whatever. She'll say uh, she's really a better mirror for me to look into. Uh, and help me out because there's more an intense scrutiny that I get from that. And so you you look in through the Word of God. You know, I I play Scrabble. I get on the internet and I've got Scrabble friends. Um, it's called Word with Friends. There's different games you can play, and uh, I can do a word and just you know. 30 seconds, but what I do is I look at that and I get a score, maybe a 25 point score. I say, but is that the best I can do? And I look for some others and I observe and the longer I look, the more I'm able to get that score up because I find another way to do something. So, you know, sometimes you just have to take time and look and uh, you'll see and get a higher score. And likewise, you take more time in looking into the Word of God, intently reflecting upon that, and you'll see what type of person that you are, and it will help you so that you can uh, make the proper adjustments. You know, men can get into bad habits, or there can be creep into your life, and you end up doing some things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. It just kind of creeps in on you. Um, there was a man named David. Remember, I said I'd get back to him. And David was making ever so slight little mistakes, little changes in his life. And then one day, he saw a woman he shouldn't have been looking upon. He knew who she was, and he called for her to come up to his uh, house. And he was married. She was married to someone else, and they laid together. And then, lo and behold, she gets pregnant, and uh, her name is Bathsheba. And so he said, hmm, "I've got to get Uriah back from the battlefront, which is where David should have been." And uh, he doesn't sleep with his wife because he says, why should I sleep with my wife and have pleasure when my comrades are out there sleeping on the ground? And so I'm not going to do that. And so he sent message back with Uriah. He hands this guy the message from King David and it says, put this man where he'll get killed. So Uriah gets killed in battle. And uh, then he takes Bathsheba as his wife. And uh, so he's done some pretty rotten things here. And he's kind of ground to the halt in his spiritual growth. And he's stuck. And God sends a man named Nathan. And Nathan gives him a backdoor message about a man who had a pet sheep and a rich man just stole the sheep from him. Even though he had sheep galore, he wanted that particular sheep. And David, being a shepherd, said, the man ought to die. What a scoundrel who did that. And Nathan said, that's you. That's what you did. And thou art a man. And suddenly, holding that mirror up in front of him, David saw his sin. And as he saw his sin, he repented. Now, sometimes, sometimes we need the help of other people or the preaching of the word of God or some prophet or some preacher to preach a message to help us 
and holding up that mirror in front of us so that we come around. And David wrote a song. And uh, many people think that uh, this is uh, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba, chapter 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Now David had done a whopper. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. He said, I was a stinker when I was born. And in my in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. I'm coming clean, Lord. I haven't been righteous. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. David felt like a leper. Hyssop is what was used to sprinkle the leper. He said, purify me with leper, hyssop. It took a miracle to cleanse the leper. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Only you can do that. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me, which was a real possibility back at that time. There was a man named King Saul who had the Spirit of God upon him, and then God left him. And he was so desperate for some type of supernatural revelation that he eventually consulted the Witch of Endor. And uh, he was devoid of spirit. And so David was afraid that the Spirit of God would leave him too. He said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. And, uh, you know, there was a man also named Peter who denied the Lord three times. And uh, Jesus said, I have prayed for you, Peter. For Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but when you have returned, strengthen your brethren. And my friends, there is men who have been in the wrong way, who thought that they knew everything, like Peter. Oh, I'll never deny you. And David, who was so after the Lord's heart, and then they slipped into sins and got off the proper path. And then the mirror was had a, held up before them. Nathan the prophet held the mirror up before him. Thou art the man. And then there was Peter. And he came, wept bitterly, and then he made his way back to God as well. So there is a way for man to make his way back. And he has to look intently into the perfect law of liberty and uh, it says, prove yourselves doers of the word. Verse 22 of James 1, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Pay attention. Check how you look, how your life is progressing. Are you living for the Lord? This passage that I'm preaching to you about consistency being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. It's a very special passage to me. For 45 years ago, uh, just one more month short of it, on February 5th, 
1978, I preached this message, be doers of the word and not hearers only. It was the first message I preached when, when I had my first church. And I have tried to live my life in being consistent with the word of God and following it. And you would do well, my friends, to be people who hear the word of God and do it. Walk the talk. Don't just be somebody who does lip service, but somebody who from his heart serves the Lord. Be a doer of the word. Look into the perfect law of liberty. Choose the way of righteousness. Avoid the way of Cain. For the righteousness of God is great, and anger and wrath and filthiness do not accomplish the righteousness of God.